So we were doing a family trip this summer to base and I didn't have, I actually didn't know where we were going. It's basically between Utrecht and Amsterdam. And I was just curious as to like, I figured if I made a map, this, this map shows more transit. Okay. And I figured if I made a map, it would just give me more of a sense of where we were going before we went there. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman, and that is Steve Spindler from Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, a in fact, a recently elected borough council member of Jenkintown. And uh, Steve is also a cartographer and a passionate bike rider. We're gonna be talking about all things maps and bikes and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, let's get right to it with Steve. Well, hey, Steve Spindler, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Hey, thanks, John. It's good to see you. I just have to show you my oh, streets yeah. are for people. Yeah, hold it, hold it just Where'd below it your chin there. Oh, Perfect. okay, there you go. There you streets go. Now me. it's in frame. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and and uh, and hopefully you you I've given you enough of them so you can plaster them all over the place there. <laughs> Uh, Steve, I love having my guests just give a quick little introduction. So who is Steve Spindler? I am a bicycle bicyclist and cartographer. I've been making bicycle maps for around the country. I also help planners with public engagement for active transportation, safe routes to school, basically finding out where people um, have problems as pedestrians or bicyclists and or transit users, that kind of thing. So yeah, and I live in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, so hopefully we can talk a little bit about Jenkintown because we have 100% coverage for sidewalks in our town, and we still have you know, plenty of traffic, but it's a walkable railroad suburb just north of Philadelphia. Fantastic. That's great. And I've never been. I, I really need to, to come and visit you and pay you a visit. Uh, I did get to meet you and see you again recently. And that uh, was in Pennsylvania for the Greenways and Trails uh, Summit, which was really super fun. That was in uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania in September. Yeah. Um, and I gave a couple of talks that I don't think were as good as yours, but... <laughs> But I wasn't the keynote, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had the job. honor of, of having the, the main uh, floor and, and being able to deliver the keynote, which is always a great deal of fun and, and got to nerd out uh, about uh, creating a culture of activity and talking about behavior change and all the good stuff that uh, when we actually get our infrastructure right and build cities so that they are walkable and bikeable, it's amazing things happen. People actually get out and move <laughs> and it's much yeah, healthier. You know, we actually, um, you know, ran into each other at the coffee shop. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, pri like the first day um, before the conference. And I think coffee shops are just hugely important for, um, you know, meeting places. And I was talking with somebody the other day who was saying, you know, I have my friends. I don't need to meet people. And, <laughs> and I find that like, like I meet really interesting people that are writing books that are, you know, you know, illustrating movies or TV shows, those kinds of like doing animation. And I meet them at Starbucks or at Whitehorse Coffee Company where, uh, where my daughter works. And, and we also see like, I just got elected to borough council. So our, you know, I, I see people on borough council you know, that are doing their borough council work at the coffee shop. And it just, it's a great place to meet up with people. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the coffee shop. Yeah. It's coffee shops are super, super magical. And it was really cool that there was this really neat little hole in the wall coffee shop there in Scranton, uh, down an alleyway, uh, across from, uh, across the street from the hotel where we were at. Uh, and, uh, it was neat because, you know, we ran into each other there and then there was a whole bunch of other people from the conference that were popping in. And so, you know, we got to meet a whole bunch of other people. And, and so I, I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up because that's part of like the sociability of communities. And I think that's a huge part of what active towns are all about. 
Yes, it is about creating an infrastructure where it's walkable and bikeable. You have access to parks and all of this. But a big part of just getting out of the door and getting into society is having these third places. And uh, it's interesting. You mentioned that you're you're now on the, the council, right? In January, yes. In January. And so you just sent an email out to your groups. And the very first thing that I notice on that is it's like Starbucks. <laughs> so what's this all about? <laughs> so, you know, Starbucks used to be what you were saying. They used to be that third space in between home and work. And now, like, the business model seems to really be oriented towards, you know, for many coffee shops, oriented towards drive throughs and you just kind of wonder why people want to sit in their car even more. So we have a Starbucks at the north end of town. It's actually in the next town over. I'm right, right on the border. And it's on a road that has like 35 to 40,000 cars a day um, that runs right through our walkable town, right through the center. It's called Old York Road. And they, they're looking at moving Kitty Corner to the other side of the intersection so that they can put a drive through and, and have a drive through. And really right now people are waiting on the main road to turn into the current parking lot of the current Starbucks. So it's, it's like a traffic challenge for people already. So what's been proposed is we have what was one of the first department stores in the country. It was Strawbridge and Clothier and that's in our town. And that's a big property that had a lot of extra parking. And so, I really think that putting the Starbucks in the middle of that parking lot is not a bad thing. And I think that's something that they'll, they'll invest more into than their current location. That said, that when you put in a drive through or any business, you're always looking at traffic flow to get into and out of that space. And this new one would have two entrances and exits if they get kind of what's proposed. And this week, actually, it's going before the borough council. OK, the borough council. Hmm. Now, so, so let's talk about, you know, how one would get there walking and biking. Is it, you know, because the sense that I get is that, in, and I think you mentioned it already, is that, you know, it's a very walkable community, village. It, is, is it also, you know, getting to these third places, are they very easy to walk and bike to? Um, it's really not a hard walk. You still have to push a button to cross the street, you know, but, but it's right now, basically, you know, it's, it's like a seven or eight minute walk from my house. Right. So the and, distances, and the proximities the, are fine. It's, it's very walkable in that sense. Yeah. What's the environment like uh, in terms of, is it a, a hostile environment in terms of motor vehicle traffic? Um, the traffic our, our town just put in um, the radar uh, speed signs and also like 25 mile an hour and uh, rumble strips. So really our town's trying to slow down traffic. And then there's also um, like a $25 million train station project coming up in the future. Um, and there's a train station right there that goes in. You can take the train from... Um, it's called Noble Train Station, and uh, you can take it from there into Philadelphia. Got it. Got it. So in addition to joining the Borough Council, uh, you are, as you mentioned, a cartographer. And so this is your website at stevespindler.com. And uh, walk us through what it means to be a cartographer. You know, they're, they're may, this is an international audience. I'm, I'm assuming everybody kind of knows what a cartographer is, but what does a cartographer do? <laughs> Cartography is not necessarily GIS. You know, GIS is about data analysis, and there's a lot of GIS in cartography, but cartography is making that information communicate with people and tell a story. Okay. So that's what I see cartography as. And, and really, I, I started by making bike maps to help people. I had what was called a CMAC project, which was congestion mitigation and air quality in the early 90s. And I was helping people bicycle, you know, figure out how to bike to work. And this was before Google Maps. And I wanted to make bike maps and put, put them on the web. And so I created bikemap.com and, and 
I use that, but not the main page at this point. So there, there's a lot on bikemap.com. It's just not accessible to people. My business model really became working with engineering firms like um, Tool Design Group and the RBA Group, and which is now NV5 and, and others. So we would do like the Philadelphia bike map or the Washington, D.C. bike map or City of Alexandria or uh, Fairfax or and I ended up doing some in for San Mateo County in California and Memphis and a lot in North Carolina. The thing about being a cartographer is it, and it's gotten faster to make maps. However, there's a lot, that, that, you know, a lot that goes into making a map and it takes a lot of time. And I kind of wanted to change how, my approach. And one of the things was, I would say I was doing the New Jersey state bike map. You have a statewide area and you have three public meetings and you have, you know, how do you get people to give public input? So in that whole process, I was thinking there's got to be, I need to not only just be giving people information, I need to be getting information and, and better reflect the perspective of the cyclists. I wanted to create something that would like let people put information on the map for me to share as a public engagement process, as opposed to just sharing a map with people. It's the cyclists, you know, nobody knows their community really better than the people who live there. Right, right. Like they know the shortcuts, they know the, the nuances, you know, how things, tra you know, change during the day. And the thing about planners can really benefit from knowing what, you know, planners have, they understand systems and how things work in a big picture and they can... They understand what's going on, going on around the country and different uh, solutions, but the, the planners really need buy-in. They need to understand the local perspectives and what people want locally. So, so I switched from making bike maps to actually getting information. We did a project in, in Columbia, Maryland, that area, and then there was so much good response for that project that I just kind of focused on building building out a solution that would help planners set up projects for themselves. Okay. And when you say a solution, what type of solution are you, are you uh, referring to there? So planners can ask whatever questions they want, and then mm -hmm. the public can put a point or draw a line on the map on and the say, map. you know, this is my route from home to school. So it's used for safe routes to school projects. And then they can say, this is where I have a problem. Got it. So it's very, know, it, yeah. yeah, it's very interactive. You're starting to more uh, intelligently engage with people so that you are, are fine tuning and bringing the map to life a little bit more. Yes. And it's not even for the map. It's, it's really for the planning process so they can figure out how, how to best allocate. It's a, funds. In other words, yeah, that's part of the solution. It's like, it, it's not for the map. It's actually here, we're going to leverage the map and get interaction with people so that the solution for the planners is a little bit better targeted to the needs of the people. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. Now, I know this about you and, and soon the audience is going to know about this about you as well, is that maps and these the there are also pieces of art they're works of art in many ways and and i look at this this map here um that you have and i look at some of these others and this is a great example right here you you showed me this um on your your phone when we were at that coffee shop that we were talking about so talk about that passion that you have. I mean, you've been knee deep in maps and bike maps for years, decades, perhaps, but you're still passionate about the art side of it. So talk, talk a little bit about what's inspired you recently to do these types of works of art. You know, I really, I, a few years ago, I was teaching at Temple University at cartography in their GIS program. And what I found is, there's no better way to learn than to teach. I used mapping programs for making maps, like it's called um, Map Publisher. It's a plugin for Adobe Illustrator. And these are very expensive. Like for somebody who's just casually mapping, it's, it's very expensive. And I wanted to figure out, you know, ways that I could make maps that were accessible so that I could teach other people how to make the maps. And this map here was made using uh, QGIS, which is open source software. And that in a combination of a program called Affinity 
Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo. It's Affinity is kind of like Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign, but it's it's different. But it kind of gives you the same result. And I really got into Affinity not because I didn't like Illustrator and the Adobe Creative Suite, but using a different program caused me to think differently about making maps. So I could think less in terms of lines. This this map uses OpenStreetMap data and uh, satellite imagery, and then I I work with it to make it. You know, I was my goal is to really create a motif, a watercolor motif with, that would blend blend both the windmill and and the town, that type of thing. Yeah, I was gonna say this this to me looks like this work of art with watercolors. And all of that, I, I could almost imagine like, oh, yeah, he he printed this out and then he took out his watercolor paintbrushes and and did this, you know, in a coffee shop and all that. But that's that's not how it was done. Right. No, no, it's done going back and forth between this. Ultimately, the map is in GIS, even though it doesn't look like it. So if I wanted to import data, I could import data right onto the map. Which could be important, like for the exact GIS location of that windmill. Yes. Because this is a real wind, windmill. Right, right. Yeah. So that's actually a um, vacation renter, uh, VRBO, I think. <laughs> really? Nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. The other thing that's that's neat about this, and you and I were talking about this in the coffee shop, is it's a way too for um, for people to be like inspired to like remember the the location. I mean, it's one thing to do what I do, which is shoot a lot of video and take a lot of uh, still photography. And then go back and remember that bike ride that I did through this area and all of this. This is like a, a whole nother level of like really bringing uh, that location and that experience to life for somebody. Because now that you've done this, I'm sure implanted in your mind is like really a, a fine tuned, fine grained memory of this, this space and this place. You know, when I look at this map, it's the yes yeah, spending time making the map vacation for me it's i'm traveling for vacation that's not there's no other purpose for it but like i can see the the walk from the windmill to the train is a little less than a mile and i can think about like the the roads that we took it's it's amazing how they've changed you know taken a two-way road and kept it two-way but put it's a two-lane road and they've used one lane for parking and, but there's like, you know, you can pull over every now and then, uh, but cars are going basically in the same lane in both directions. And, and so I just remember those kinds of things where the raised intersections are or where the canals are. And yeah, it really helps me create a mental map. The mental map's more important to me than, than the image ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned you're, you're typically, you know, you're on vacation during these times. And so you're, you're traveling. I'm assuming you're traveling with your family or are you on solo vacation? Either my family or my wife, my wife or my yeah. wife and kids and extended family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, but I, I, I have to give a shout out to the fact that, yeah, your, 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 your kids are, are into this stuff too. So they, uh, they enjoy getting out of the bike. This is, this is from a, a little while ago though, right? So my daughter, Jessica, she's at GW now. So she's in college yeah. Yeah, and yeah. she so uses is- bike share in DC um, and she loves the Metro. Yeah. She uses the Metro almost all the time. Um, I, I love and, I love the, the the title that you had for that uh, that photo that that photos uh, was girl power and it was like oh, yeah right. she was girl power and then this one is titled thumbs up so so <laughs> this is this is I'm glad you brought these up um, that's my daughter Kate and she's a senior in high school but she did her uh, college essay on you know her love of bicycling like, oh wow really there's there's this program called Apogee Adventures. Um, and my kids have done lots of travel all over the world. So um, there's this program called CISV, Children's International Summer Village, where kids, when they're, when they're 11, they start 
you know, traveling around, like they'll go in a group delegation of four people. Sorry, this is getting off topic, but I think no, it's really, this is perfect. I it's love really this. important because so when Jessica, basically they go and they meet kids from a dozen other countries and spend a month with them learning about each other's cultures. And that's really important today, I think. But so when Jessica was 11, she went to Quito, Ecuador. And when Kate was 11, she went to Vancouver. And then Kate went to Brazil and Jessica went to Paris and, and Norway. And I can't say enough good things about CISV. There are these chapters all over the, the country and they work. It's sorry, I got that's that's going off in a whole different direction. But my I, kids, no, I, I think they it, I travel think by themselves. And yeah. so Apogee, Apogee has a lot of the same ethos as as CISV. And uh. and so Kate went on this bicycle trip. What I want to get to is is telling you like the joys of keeping your kids on bikes through through high school. So so when she was 11, she did this trip to Vancouver. And when she was 12, my friend PJ asked me if I wanted to bike from our house, which is just north of Philadelphia, to Cape May in New Jersey with his family. So when she was 12, she was like, yeah, let's do it. So we biked 100 miles. Nice. Nice. And I'm going to pull up the, the map here of, of, of Jenkintown, where, where you guys live. And how, how large is the, the borough itself? It's like three quarters of a square mile. Okay. So it's a pretty compact little, little area. Yeah. We here. have no school buses. You we have, have no this, school about buses. This, about the smallest school district in the state. Yeah. And so I'm going to assume, and this may, may be inappropriate for me to assume this, but I'm going to assume that your, your girls grew up having the run of the place. It's fairly walkable and they, they you know, get around on by bike. Um, were they pretty much free range kids? Yes. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie that a car helped with that. Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, I think it, it, we, so, but, this but is North friends, America. Yeah. I mean, after all, yeah. this is a car centric world, but I think it, it, it gives inspiration to the fact that, you know, Hey, when we do what we can to to make a place more walkable and bikeable and traffic calm when traffic calm, you know, it, when we when we need to and we have to. And suddenly when especially I think for for girls that are, you know, after elementary school, because I think you and I may have had this conversation, is that especially for girls you know, maybe they're riding, you know, walking and riding their bikes to school quite a bit in elementary school and maybe into middle school. But then when they get into high school, oftentimes, oh, it's not cool anymore to be riding your bike. And so the, you, you get some pressures, societal pressures. But I think that you can change that from a cultural perspective where a, a, a strong active town's culture of activity and the empowerment that takes place, and we see this in the Netherlands a lot, where, you know, you'll see entire packs of, of the tweens and the, the teenagers, uh, both boys and girls, you know, all over town. And it's just so incredibly heartwarming to me to be able to see the free range kids. Mm. Yeah, the, I, my daughters do not like my younger daughter, Kate, bikes. And so she, so I told you, like she, when she was 12, she, we, she also biked from central Vermont up to Montreal, but she doesn't have friends who bike. We, we tried, okay. we tried doing like a Jenkintown bike group. Right. Um, and when sort the kids of like were a bike bus or no, this or was like on Saturday fa fam, family bike rides. Oh, uh, okay. Family so bike more, rides. more and, recreational in nature, trying to get something like that started. Uh, was there any kind of a culture of other other kids walking and biking to school? There are there are a few few kids who bike to school, and lots of kids walk to school. Okay, and, and that makes sense because there's no buses. But parents don't really want their kids to bike that much because they don't feel safe with their kids biking, even even on a, a neighborhood street. Interesting. So it's still and 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 what's interesting about that too is that. I would suspect if, if we took this Jenkintown borough and we looked at this place two generations ago, I would think that the kids, you know, in other words, you know, two generations ago, you know, the parent, the, the, the parents of the parents of these kids, they probably walked and biked all over the neighborhood in the, in the borough. 
Um, yeah, there, there are definitely kids who do bike. I think biking outside of the town becomes hard in, in particular because the, the roads are very car centric surrounding the town as well. And then people use, people use the town to, as a cut through sometimes, um, and so in other words, you're saying it's it, it's anywhere USA, North America, in terms of is, you, you've got a nice little hamlet, you know, and it's very walkable and bikeable. And then then you get you run into the strodes and you run into the fast traffic. Yeah, that you can still outside to the right of the of that map is is a nice park. So my daughter often bikes to that park. Um, but what I wanted to say is, is like kids biking with other kids is the best thing for like their enthusiasm for bicycling. Right. Like it's not kids biking with their parents. My daughter bikes with me because I'm the last resort, but she's made great friends like biking, you know, from Oregon down to San Francisco and those kinds of things with other kids her age. Yeah. That's interesting, you know, and, and, and that's a rather unique perspective in the sense that, that is very much a, a form of recreational cycling, uh, but it's also has a purpose to it because you're getting from point A to point B and point A and point B happen to be quite, a, quite far apart. <laughs> so uh, it, I'm not going to say that it's just purely recreation. It's not like just going out for a loop ride on any particular day. I mean, it's, it's bike tourism. It's, it's actually adventure cycling. And there is an entire genre of cycling around, you know, getting from one place to the next and you're going to do it under your own power. Well, that and there's also um, adventure cycling came up with this bike overnights. Yeah, they they had bikeovernights.org for quite a while. So my daughter and I love to do long distance bicycling, like bike touring, biking from our house, uh, like leaving after school on a Friday and biking halfway to New York near Princeton, and then camping overnight and then biking the rest of the way, and then we can take the train back from New York on Saturday. Now, earlier, earlier you mentioned uh, Kate's trip. So let's pull up her, her, her map here. Yeah. This was, uh, this, this was her birthday present to me. She was like, dad, for your birthday, do you want to bike to New York? Nice. So, so this is the route, um, from our house, you know, a lot of the, there's the East coast greenway. So a lot of this is on the East coast greenway. And then there's the Staten Island has a, a great bridge to bike over to Staten Island on that's, and then you can take the ferry for free from Staten Island over to Manhattan. Yeah. And then just bring your bike on New Jersey transit or Amtrak back to Trenton, that kind of thing. Very cool. What was this like? I mean, this experience being able to do this with your daughter, you know, the first time, the first long trip we did together was from Ithaca to Niagara Falls. And that was during COVID and we, we had never done any long trips together before. And so I let her really dictate how far we would go. And we started off like with 20 miles and got to 40 miles. And we did a 60 mile day over nine days and did a loop. But there's no better way to spend time with your kid than to spend like nine days alone with your daughter, like exploring together. Cause, cause when you're both on a bike, you're both responsible. And there were times when like, you know, my back wheel broke and she went ahead and, you know, checked out a restaurant for us and that kind of thing. So then that was like bicycle touring and the, I did the Ithaca bicycle map. So the Ithaca Tompkins County bike map. So we left our car at my client's house to do that trip. But for this trip, we experimented with like ultralight, you know, the gravel bike setup. Okay. So, All right. so we had, we didn't take panniers. We took, you know, handlebar bags and seat bags. Oh, nice. And, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't know that you and I have had this conversation. Um, do you, do you follow um, my friend Ryan Van Duzer? So yeah, actually before we did our trip to Niagara Falls, um, Ryan had done his bike ride, his love cycles bike ride. Right. Yeah and gone on the Erie Canal. And I actually mapped the Erie Canal for Parks and Trails New York for their guidebook. And then the Hudson River, the Empire State Trail as well. So nice. It was nice. I, I think uh, Ryan brings this 
you know, ever since his like Central America videos that like that experience, he just brings great enthusiasm to, you know, regardless of whether it's bicycling or not. I think, you know, Ryan does a great job. Well, I mean, just and, and his his whole thing is inspiring people to get outside and explore and and really enjoy the outdoors and 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 obviously bike packing is one thing you know that he's been doing with a lot of uh, doing that light setup uh, you know uh, on mountain bikes and and getting off the road and all of that. You mentioned the love cycles. That's when he uh, did the trip uh, with his girlfriend at the time from uh, coast to coast, and they tried to do as much of the off-road, uh, you know, off, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? The off-road trails, like the canals, like here, we've got the DNR canal here. And so that was a, a big part of that was to try to loop together and link together, uh, and get off of the busy highway sort of, uh, uh, experience of which sometimes that's one of the challenges with bike touring is you end up on some really nasty car sewers and then you're just dying to be able to get onto a, a quiet country road or uh, one of these canal paths. You know, you bring up a good point, but I must say, so the DNR Canal, we biked on the DNR Canal, then we got off of it and we biked next to it. Great roads next to it. And and a lot of times, and same with the Erie Canal, we, we biked west on the Erie Canal, but we came back along Lake Ontario. And I think you miss out on a lot if you just stick to the trails. Right. Yeah. Especially if those trails aren't well connected to the villages and, and, and all of that. And that's one of the things that I try to um, emphasize with any of these off road, you know, types of pathways, off street network of pathways is ensuring that there is that connectivity and that really the sort of a, a melding with the villages that they're going through. In the case of many of the uh, rail trail conversions, uh, that it's quite natural because those were previous rail stops, you know, into the, the, the towns and the villages. And sometimes with the canals too, but yeah, it's, if you're not really in t- in intentional about it, and this gets back to the planning uh, side of things, is working with the community members to say, you know, hey, you know, what would be the, like the intelligent places for you to connect with these trails and these pathways so that they can be functional and much more, you're much more apt to use them and, and, and help, help serve some utilitarian trips too. Yeah. And another aspect of that is not just the connectivity, but the connectivity to camping, that, overnight yes. bike camping. So yes. we have, we have the Penny Pack Trail that's right by our house. It's just east and the Penny Pack Trail in Philadelphia. And now there's a trail that goes up through Montgomery County and, and along that trail, there's actually a campground that people don't really know about. But it's a youth, a youth campground for group camping. But it, it doesn't show up on this map. Yeah, I, I noticed. I know it doesn't show up on this one, but I wanted to. I, I don't think we had a map of that. But I, I love the fact that I, I glanced over and I'm like, oh, with camping options. So this is to your point is is, you know, kind of identifying some routes. And, you know, and, and I think this is really important for when you're thinking out these routes of, you know, for bike touring is the fact that, yeah, what are the camping options that are along these routes? Yes. And sometimes you're not going to make it to your campsite. Right. Like even if, if, even if there is one, I saw people camping along the, the Hudson river, um, greenway for the empire state trail. And also sometimes you need to just get off, get off the trail Still, the, another aspect of it is there might be campsites, um, Hickory Run State Park, which is on this map near the Black, um, it's kind of between Jim Thorpe and the Black Diamond uh, Trailhead on, in the center. That's about 100 miles from my house. So I, I biked up there for a meeting and it was March and the camps, they, it said, you know, campground open year round, but there wasn't, it wasn't open um, in the state park. So I ended up like, just camping along a creek, you know, road camping. And you don't really want to have to feel like, like you have to do that. There are warm showers, you know, warmshowers.org and things like that. But people I found 
are real. Like if you just stop and ask them, they're they're often more than happy to let you put your tent up or just stay on their living room floor. Yeah. Or a couple of years ago, we were biking from Penn Yan in New York to Buffalo and we didn't make it to the campsite that we wanted to. And we stopped at a fire station and you know, all these volunteer firemen were outside and they said, sure, you can put your tent up behind the fire station. And they left the door open. Yeah. And for, so we could use the bathroom and that kind of thing. And people are really, when you're biking, it's a great way to see, it's a great way to see the good human nature of people. Yeah. When I was biking, I, back in 93, I biked from Philadelphia to Victoria, British Columbia. And when I was leaving town, I was at Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia. And there was a homeless guy there. He was like, aren't you scared? There are no people there around. Or, and I found, you know, as I was biking, people in rural areas were often scared of people in urban areas. Like, but, but they were all nice, you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the, the camping, getting back to like the hiker biker campsites are something that we really need in Pennsylvania and the East Coast, kind of like you have in Oregon where you're biking down the West, you know, the Oregon coast and you see people from all over the world at hiker biker sites. And it's a very international experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll echo kind of what uh, you were saying too, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of watching, you know, Ryan's content and, you know, it, it seems like every other video he's like, you know, meeting up with somebody on the trail and he calls them trail angels and, you know, he'll be in a tight spot. And then the next thing he knows, he's able to connect with somebody, uh, he, especially like in Sweden, he did that the whole length of Sweden and, you know, was able to connect multiple times when he wasn't able to get to the desired stopping place or the weather was terrible. And yeah, the, the, just the, the level of, of welcoming folks, you know, out there on the road and, and, you know, he would just, you know, knock and say, you know, where's a good place for me to stay? And they'll be like, oh, you can stay here. <laughs> and so you just, I think that's part of it is we just have to be less fearful of others and, and people that we don't, you know, really know. I mean, strangers, it's like the, 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 the fearfulness of, of strangers. And, and I think that if we have it in our heart and, and I think Ryan says this beautifully, he's just like he, his default mode is always to think good about other people. You know, the other thing that scares people on doing long distance rides is failure of your bike or, or traffic, both of those things. And or your body. <laughs> yeah. No, or your body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. Talk about that a little bit is, you know, especially like from the standpoint of your daughters. I mean, I get the sense that there's a, a sense of self-efficacy and self-confidence that has built over time with them that, yeah, I can handle this. I can do this. I'm, I'm sure there were, were times early on where they didn't necessarily think that they could do it. Well, we started off biking together and... I don't know. I think they, one, one, my older daughter, you know, would revolt against bicycling as a family. And my younger daughter, I always made sure my younger daughter had the best bike possible. <laughs> and it helped that my, you know, Fuji's located, you know, it was located in Philadelphia. And so she grew up on all these different Fuji's and, and then that was just kind of nice. But like, I think having an, a really nice bike helps helps people, helps girls to, you want to bike on, if you're on a nice bike, it's, it's just, it just helps. It's, you're just reducing the barrier. So I don't think my kids ever, when my kids were like three and five or something like that, we moved from one part of Jenkin down to the other. And we, we pulled, you know, I had my older daughter pulling a trailer behind her little bike. Then we would, we got one of these bikes at work trailers. Um, I don't know if you've seen those, they're like nine feet long. And so we would, my friend, Mike Dannemiller from Northern New Jersey came down and he was pulling this trailer and, you know, people were coming to help us move by bike oh, neat. from neat. one house to the other. As a parent, you know, I had Congressman Blumenauer from Oregon, Earl Blumenauer, he, he came to our town. And so I made sure my daughter met with him and she asked him like, why do you like bikes? And yeah, so I was, I was very proactive as a parent to, 
to get my kids engaged with bikes. But engaged with bikes, yeah. You can't you can't teach you can't force your kids to do anything. One liked to bike and one didn't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah not a problem. I, I pulled this map up uh, simply because it 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 it, it basically has uh, the Appalachian Trail uh, identified. This is. Uh, the Lehigh Gap, and uh, just uh, an hour and a half away from from where you're at. Now, is that an hour and a half away bike riding or by car? No, that's that's by car. Okay, by but car. you could you could yeah. it would be a good day trip. You could bike up there and camp. Okay, um, and then you could, there's a campsite where the bridge crosses the river there. Yeah, uh, for for canoeing, so you could bike up there camp and then bike home the next day. It would be a good trip, and it's on the uh, Delaware and Lehigh. National Heritage Trail. Yeah. So that's a lot of it is on trail. Fantastic. Yeah. And I noticed that this is clearly one of your maps. No, this was just for fun. You know, like this, yeah. this wasn't for any client or anything. I just, I like to just, you know. Well, that's exactly what I meant by one of your maps. You did, It looks like you did this just for fun. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. And that, this one used, that used like land use. You know, we had been looking at that VASP map from the Netherlands mm-hmm. and different, you know, when you have land use patterns that are like so separate from like the town and then then the the agriculture areas or natural areas, it gives you much more to work with for mapping. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's just absolutely beautiful, the work that you're doing. And talk us through what you were looking at doing here. So we were doing a family trip this summer to VASP. And I didn't have, I actually didn't know where we were going. It's basically between Utrecht and Amsterdam. And I was just curious as to, like, I figured if I made a map, this, this map shows more transit. Okay. And I figured if I made a map, it would just give me more of a sense of where we were going before we went there. Like, I can't, it's hard for me to visualize, like I could put like points where we might want to go, and, but I, I needed to spatially make the map so I could visualize it. Nice. Yeah. You're, I, I, I think, Steve, your, your brain thinks in maps. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very linear. I, go, I get distracted and go all over the place. Um, but so using maps, like for me, I was an English major in college and like my final semester in college, I took a class, a cartography class. And I was like, it was, this was by hand. This was like 1990. And, and I thought I can spend a lot of time and make something that I like. So yeah, I just kind of stuck with it. Yeah. As I uh, scroll on your, 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 your webpage a little bit here, um, what final thoughts uh, do you have? Anything that we haven't already covered uh, that you'd like to share with the audience? You know, a lot of what I've been doing is um, public engagement. And I think, you know, a lot of times we have public engagement around. I like that one. If you click on that, this was in Illinois this summer. The, if you, if you, I don't think public engagement begins with like a long, long range plan. Like right now, there might be like a 2035 or 2050 or whatever plan that a community is doing. But as like elected leaders and representatives, I think we need to be convic- communicating with people on a regular basis because once like, so I started an email list on election day. I was running for our borough council and I thought, you know, when I had no people signed up for my email list, I thought, uh, this isn't going to go anywhere. I was ready to give up. And then by the end of the day, we had like, with help from others, I had like 87 people and, you know, that's doubled like in the last month. I think that public engagement starts with letting people know how they can connect with you and being in constant, you know, talking about not just problems, but talking about systems and, you know, how this, you know, road with 40,000 cars is affected in different areas, not just our town. Then you find out, you know, what people's concerns are. So for me, I, in just in the last week, you know, I've connected with, you know, government leaders from nearby communities and I'm learning about what they're doing. And even if, you know, 
our jurisdictions are right next to each other, but it's so easy to not pay attention to what's going on next to you. So I just think that, you know, we can do things as communities or we can do things as more council of governments and collaboratively. Uh, but that ongoing communication with people, I think, is is key. Yeah. What would you say is the, the main reason you were inspired to run and serve? I avoided it for a long time. <laughs> and then you just silently said, but, well, it's time for well, me to, to step up and serve. You know? <laughs> no, I was president of our business improvement district. So like economic development, kind of tying neighbors and residents or residents and businesses. And, and this, and that was several years ago and, and really got burned out. Yeah. And, but before, like, I think I've had so many experiences. You know, I've served on SEPTA's Citizen Advisory Committee and been a board member of the Bicycle Coalition and Neighborhood Bike Works in the past. And I have the experience. And I, I just figure I can use this by being on Borough Council. I can use it as a platform to get other people to step up. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, you know, absolutely. It, it's, yeah. It, people, can't, people aren't going to step up unless they understand how things work. Sure. So I can talk about, you know, in my email, I can talk about the transportation improvement plan and how that relates to the state improvement plan and, you know, how that relates to the fact that the, another municipality got $16 million and we didn't. Those right. kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Uh, it, it, because I think that that is, is something that I say to every single uh, uh person who is an elected official as well as city staff, I thank them because uh, it, it oftentimes is a thankless <laughs> endeavor. And, uh, and we absolutely do need people to step up and do that. And so uh, it's vitally important that uh, good people do that. Thanks. And people do like, like our borough council has 12 people on it and they all work really hard. And, but as we always need to be letting other people know what's going on and and how hard people are working on their behalf right so yeah 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 steve thank you so very much for joining me on the active towns podcast it's been such a joy and pleasure uh, catching up once again it's my pleasure thanks john hey thank you so much for tuning in i hope you enjoyed this episode with steve spindler and if you did please give it a thumbs up leave a comment down below and share it with a friend and if you haven't done so already i'd be honored to have you subscribe to the active towns channel just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell and if you're enjoying this content that i'm producing here on the active towns channel please consider supporting my efforts by becoming a patreon member uh hit buy me a coffee or youtube super thanks right down below uh buying things from the Active Town Store helps out a great deal as well, as well as making donations to the nonprofit. And special announcement here, I am going to be reconnecting with my good friend, Ryan Van Duzer, who I mentioned in this episode. Uh, we are going to be doing a live stream holiday celebration. It's an annual thing that Ryan and I like to do, and that will be on Friday the 22nd, and that will be 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so please join in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. And until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.